Welcome everyone to this uh, to this episode uh, of the lecture series jointly jointly organized by the Cambridge Arbitration Society and the Lauterbach Center in International Law. Uh, this lecture will focus on the future of oil and gas arbitration. Uh, my name is Alina Papanastasiu. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge and a, the treasurer of the Cambridge Arbitration Society. And we have the honor today to have with us uh, two renowned speakers and professionals who are going to, de to discuss this very, very interesting topic. topic. Um, I'm sure now, there, there is no need uh, to, for introduction for neither of them, but I'm gonna say a few words for the sake of good order. Um, I'll start by Mr. Scott Vessel. Uh, Scott Vessel is a partner in the Bahrain office of Three Crowns LLP. Uh, he has a decade, decade of experience handling complex international investment and commercial arbitration in the oil and gas sector, in construction, energy, technology, and the agribusiness sectors, among others. Uh, in addition to his private practice in international arbitration, he has previously served uh, as an attorney advisor at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, and he's, uh, he's frequently ranked as one of the leading arbitrators by uh, various databases, including the Who's Who's Legal and the Legal 500 UK. Moving on to our next speaker for, this, for today, Professor uh, Mohammed Abdel Wahab. Uh, is a founding partner and head of international arbitration, construction and energy groups at the Cairo-based law firm Zulfika and Partners, as well as a professor of international arbitration, private international law and English contract law at Cairo University. Uh, he has sat as a vice president at the ICC Court of Arbitration between 2015 and 2021. Uh, and he often serves as our as counsel and, ar and uh, an arbitrator uh, in arbitration cases. He's again has uh, has received many uh, many honors and descriptions on, on, as one of the world's leading arbitrator practitioners by various by various rankings, and he's widely published. Uh, and with this, uh, I won't spend more, more time. I'm sure I could I could uh, I spend an entire lecture, an entire webinar describing the accomplishment of both our speakers today. But I leave the floor to them uh, to speak about uh, today's topic, which is the future of oil and gas arbitration. And with this, I'll give the floor to Mr. Scott Vessel. Thank you very much, Alina, and thank you to the organizers for um, according. Uh, me the privilege to be here and to speak alongside Professor Abdul Wahab. Uh, the topic today is the future of oil and gas arbitration, but we thought it would be useful to set the scene to discuss the future by recalling certain features of the past and present. And so the way we propose to proceed is that I will deal with the ghosts of arbitration past and present and then hand over to Professor Abdel Wahab to uh, consider the ghosts of arbitration future. And as, as just an overarching observation to situate the discussion, we'll be focusing on specific features of oil and gas arbitrations. So of course in the oil and gas sector, you can have the same sort of arbitrations as you have in any sector, such as construction disputes or M&A disputes and that sort of thing. But we, the focus today is on very specific features of oil and gas disputes. So with that, let's start by considering the past. As many of you will know, the use of arbitration to resolve international oil and gas disputes is largely a phenomenon of the post-World War II period. The key international instruments with which you're all familiar that have facilitated the growth of international arbitration were adopted in the 1950s and 1960s. In particular, I'm referring to the 1958 New York Convention on Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Award and the 1965 ICSID Convention. And it's useful to recall that those conventions came into being in an international context of decolonization. This may seem like ancient history to many of you, but um, for those of us who've been around uh, long enough to, to remember that, um, it, it was a very different historical moment. And in that moment, international arbitration offered uh, 
certain key advantages for newly sovereign states that emerged from decolonization. And the key advantage was that it depoliticized disputes at a time when they were just taking control of their natural resources and the levers of state power. In other words, arbitration offered a way to shift the resolution of disputes from the realm of politics to the realm of law. And it shielded these newly sovereign states from the use of diplomatic protection or threats of force by the home states of investors. Conversely, for international investors, arbitration offered a number of advantages, not only the usual advantages of arbitration, uh, but also it allowed to delocalize disputes with sovereign states, removing those disputes from the home court bias of local courts, as well as the potential perceived idiosyncrasies or unpredictability of having a dispute resolved in a newly developing domestic legal system. So let's think back to some of the early oil and gas arbitrations, which were really seminal in the development of the entire field. And, and the first one I want to recall is a 1949 dispute between a group of oil majors of the day and the Sheikh of Abu Dhabi. And the dispute concerned the boundaries of a concession area under a 1939 concession agreement. The Sheikh of Abu Dhabi had granted this 1939 concession, um, which covered the mainland and islands. And then he granted another concession that uh, concerned offshore exploration. And the holders of the original concession took the position that their concession extended into offshore and included both the territorial waters and the continental shelf. Continental shelf, apologies. And so this is where our first ghost of arbitration past enters the scene, and that is Lord Asquith, a judge on the English Court of Appeal, who was appointed to resolve this dispute. And in his decision, he refused to apply the law of Abu Dhabi to the interpretation of the concession agreement on the basis that, quote, it would be fanciful to suggest that in this very primitive region, there is any settled body of legal principles applicable to the construction of modern legal instruments, end quote. So notwithstanding Lord Asquith's um, arrogance, one might say imperial arrogance toward the law of Abu Dhabi, he resolved the dispute largely in favor of the Sheikh, concluding that the initial concession only covered the narrow band of territorial waters and didn't extend onto the continental shelf. Nonetheless, his dismissive attitude towards local law, local law held back the development of arbitration for, for some time in the region thereafter. So now let's jump ahead to the 1970s. As many of you will know, by that time, most of the former colonized territories around the world had achieved independence, and those with extensive oil and gas deposits were increasingly unwilling to continue the terms on which international oil companies were exploiting their oil and gas resources. And this is in a context of dramatically rising oil prices and the creation of OPEC in the 1960s and its increasing activism in the 1970s. And the, the seminal award in this period is that of Amin Oil against Kuwait. And that arbitration highlights two types of issues that have given rise to many, many disputes in the sector over the years since. And that those two are stabilization clause and expropriation. The Amin Oil dispute arose under a 1948 concession agreement between Kuwait and Amin Oil, which was a US company. And under that concession, the price was based on a fixed royalty for Amin Oil for every ton of oil recovered. And crucially, the concession agreement contained a stabilization clause that prevented Kuwait from unilaterally annulling or altering the terms of the agreement. Now, they had subsequently agreed to a 50-50 profit sharing arrangement in addition to the royalties. But Kuwait at some point demanded a further increase in its take from the project based on a, uh, an OPEC uh, standard set of terms. 
but Ammon Oil refused. They said they would lose money on every barrel of oil if they accepted those terms. And so Kuwait proceeded to nationalize the concession. And so the question before the arbitral tribunal was whether that expropriation was in breach of the stabilization clause that prohibited Kuwait from unilaterally annulling the concession. The tribunal, and this is, was sort of the key pe feature of their analysis, they refused to read the stabilization clause as an absolute prohibition on nationalization. And instead they held that it only barred what they referred to as confiscatory nationalization. In other words, if there was going to be a nationalization, that would be fine as long as compensation would, was paid. And they proceeded to determine how much compensation was payable. And another feature of this decision is useful because this is where the ghost of Lord Asquith departs the scene because there was a, a key question was debated by the parties was which law applied to the concession agreement. And in this case, although nothing ultimately turned on it, the tr tribunal had little difficulty in concluding that Kuwaiti law should apply. And since then, that issue has, um, you know, there has never been a concern that one could not apply the local law because of some defect in it. So before moving forward to the present, I would just note that stabilization clauses such as the one at issue in Ammon Oil have been a very rich source of disputes in the oil and gas sec sector. As one might expect, states are often tempted to use their levers of power to increase their take from a project and can be very creative in doing so, whether through taxes, charges, uh, other, other means that um, ultimately benefit the state at the expense of the concessionaire. And in this context, I would note for um, historical context, the evolution in the types of stabilization clause that one sees. So some of the earlier contracts included what are referred to as freezing clauses in which the legal regime applicable to a particular concession uh, would be fixed in time for the duration. That those clauses are increasingly rare and instead what one sees are two types of clauses. One is a, a clause that protects the investor against negative changes in the legal regime, so increases in taxes for example, and another one is a, a more vague protection of the economic equilibrium. In other words, where changes in law significantly alter the economic equilibrium, equilibrium between the parties, there will be an obligation to negotiate and agree changes to the agreement to restore that equilibrium. And as you can imagine, those clauses are very, very difficult to enforce, very difficult for arbitral tribunals to implement in terms of changing the agreement. So an, another key moment in this historical development is the arrival of production sharing agreements or PSAs on the scene. There were some earlier examples, but it is generally thought that the key moment in the arrival of PSAs was the adoption by Indonesia of the PSA model in the 1960s. And it's it spread from there and is now perhaps the most common mechanism for international oil and gas companies to uh, agree with the state on how they're going to develop and exploit a, a concession or a particular block. And at a high level of generality, for those who haven't seen a PSA before, PSA operates as follows. The contractor, which may be an individual company or more typically a consortium, obtains the exclusive right to explore and develop oil and gas resources in a particular geographic area. The contractor will bear all of the costs and all of the risks of the exploration work. And these costs will be recorded in what is often referred to as a pool of recoverable costs that will be recovered in the future from production. If a commercial discovery is made and the project moves into production, then the production will be divided into two tranches. So on the one hand, there will be a pool of 
cost petroleum, which will go to cover the capital and operational expenditures, including all of the past exploration costs. And then the second tranche is the profit petroleum, which is then divided under a profit sharing formula between the state and the, the contractor. And as many of you will be familiar from practice or from reading in the field, PSAs have been an extraordinarily rich source of disputes in the international arbitration space. In addition to the sorts of stabilization clause disputes that one might also find under a concession agreement, PSAs will generate disputes over costs, in particular where something has gone wrong on a project and the state considers that the contractor should have to bear the cost of repairing it or damages and so on. They can also give rise to disputes over the application of the production sharing formulas, in particular the profit sharing formula, which can be quite complex in a lot of these disputes or in, in a lot of these contracts. And in more recent years, and this now we're starting to get to the present, these early PSAs are starting to come to their end. And so we're starting to see disputes, what we refer to as end of PSA disputes. So disputes about decommissioning, abandonment obligations, and various other things that arise at the end of the long term PSA. So now we arrive at the present, which I consider to be the, the 21st century. And I think the, perhaps the best ghost of arbitration present might be former Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez. Uh, although the, the heady oil prices of the early 2000s are now a thing of the past, the international arbitration field is still dealing with the consequences of the responses of governments in Venezuela, Ecuador, elsewhere to those very high oil prices which were perceived in the early 2000s as giving rise to unfair windfall profits for oil companies and gave rise to a series of expropriations, windfall profits taxes, and, and the like. And in a sense, there is a, a back to the future aspect to this early 2000s um, phenomenon in that in many ways it resembles the oil nationalizations that we saw in the 1970s and the disputes that followed. But one key difference is that these more recent disputes are taking place against the background of a much more established and developed international arbitration field. And a second key difference is that such disputes have, are increasingly arising under investment treaties as well as contracts. Now it's important to keep a sense of scale the number of investment treaty disputes, although they're very much in the public eye, is much, much smaller than the number of commercial arbitrations. And to just give a sense of the, the different scale, according to a 2018 article, as of 2016, there had been 70, 70 ICSID treaty-based arbitrations in the oil and gas industry. Whereas in that same year alone of 2016, there were 126 oil and gas arbitrations at the ICC alone. So there is an order of magnitude more disputes in the commercial uh, contractual arbitration space, most of which are not public. And so much of what one, one can see in terms of the case law comes from the treaty arbitration space, but which is only a small fraction of, of the world of disputes out there. And the, many of you will be familiar with the increasing contentiousness around treaty arbitration, countries like Venezuela and others denouncing the ICSID convention, denouncing their bilateral investment treaties. And so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to Professor Abdul Wahab in due course, uh, if he wishes to consider whether uh, investment treaty arbitration will be a ghost of arbitration future, something that no longer will be a prominent feature. But before I hand over to Professor Abdul Wahab, I wanted to highlight two other significant categories of oil and gas arbitration in the present. And the first category is disputes under joint operating agreements or JOAs. So these agreements are 
put in place in the context of oil and gas blocks that are being built and developed by consortia of oil companies. And they govern things like decision making, the obligations to pay cash calls to cover the cost of operations. And they typically will designate one of the partners as the operator and will define the scope of the operator's duties and authority. These agreements have given rise and continue to give rise to a number of types of disputes, such as disputes over approvals of proposed joint operations, disputes over accounting, disputes over failures to pay cash calls, and perhaps most interestingly, disputes over the operator, the operator's duties, the operator's removal or replacement if they're not doing their job properly, and in particular disputes over the operator's liability. And I'll just highlight one example of a high profile JOA dispute in, in the very recent past, which relates to the Deepwater Horizon disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. So there, JOA contained what's referred to as an exculpatory clause under which the operator, which was BP, would not be liable to the other consortium members for losses arising from the operator's activities unless there was gross negligence or willful misconduct. So there, Andarco, which was one of the joint venture partners, refused to contribute to the shares, to its share of the cost of cleanup on the basis that those losses and costs were due to BP's gross negligence. Now that dispute was ultimately settled by Andarco paying $4 billion towards the cost, but otherwise being released from further liability. You can imagine how those types of disputes on a much smaller scale are, are quite common. So the second broad category of disputes in the present, it relates to pricing disputes under long-term gas contracts. I don't know if any, anyone on the line has seen these types of disputes before, is familiar with these kinds of contracts, but these long-term gas supply contracts typically include an elaborate formula for fixing the price and then a mechanism for price reviews that can be triggered in certain circumstances and then involves an arbitral tribunal setting a new price. And I just wanna highlight one recent historical development that is having a profound impact in this space. And that development is the emergence of natural gas trading hubs, which are relevant to the pricing of natural gas. And to, to understand why this is significant, it's important to recall a bit of the history of natural gas and how it was marketed. When natural gas first became produced in sufficient quantities to be marketed, it was very unclear how it should be priced because actually it was very cheap to produce. And so the solution that was found at the time was to set the price of natural gas by reference to competing fuels on the local market, typically oil and coal. And that mechanism has been historically implemented in these long-term gas supply contracts. So most typically there will be a pricing formula that will benchmark the gas price to crude oil prices and sometimes a basket of other economic uh, and, and other features. But the emergence of gas trading hubs means that we now have direct natural gas prices. Uh, we have a market that didn't exist before. And what we've seen is that the prices of natural gas and crude oil are no longer uh, linked. In other words, they can move in different directions. And so linking in these long contracts, the price of gas to the price of oil tends to no longer make a lot of sense. But in these long term contracts, the formula was set before the arrival of hubs. And so we're starting to see cases where arbitral tribunals are actually changing pricing formulas to include bring in hub prices as part of the pricing formula. And so you know, again, I leave it to the next segment of the, this discussion to consider whether crude oil benchmarks for natural gas pricing will be amongst the ghosts of the future of oil and gas arbitration. But with that sort of background to the past and the current um, types of disputes, I'm very pleased to hand over to Professor Abdul Wahab.
Thank you very much, Mr. Vessel. Uh, and uh, before I give the floor to Professor Abdul Wahab, just to remind everyone that you can pose your questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and uh, with that reminder, uh, I'll leave it to Professor Abdul Wahab to uh, speak to us about the, about the, uh, his prediction of the, on the future of oil and gas arbitration, about the ghosts of the future. Uh, well, thank you very much for the kind invitation. It is a pleasure to be with you today and for the Lauterbach Institute uh, invitation and to be speaking alongside my esteemed colleague, Mr. Scott Vessel, who I think has given us a tour de force in relation to the past and the present. Uh, looking into the future is something that is not easy. And if we do not understand and appreciate our past and present, there is really no visibility as to what may transpire into the future. Let me start with a number of points, and I think the, the excellent expose provided by Mr. Vassell has paved the way for what I intend to discuss with you in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Now, the energy sector is a very rich and volatile sector in a way. It's capital intensive. Um, and as always, it involves an uncertain political landscape combined with cross-border uh, investments in energy products. And there are always fluctuations in terms of pricing, uh, dealing with parties, different uh, models and structures, diverse players across the globe, uh, involvement of state entities and state-owned entities. Um, so across the energy spectrum, it is a sector that is destined to, be, uh, to provide a recipe, a rich recipe for disputes. Um, it suffices to say and to confirm what my esteemed uh, colleague, Mr. Vessel has said, uh, on the investment arbitration front, the ICSID latest uh, uh, report on statistics in July 2021 shows that the oil and gas and mining account for about 25% of the uh, ISDS type of proceedings. And that's only in relation to ICSID. And if we add to that, the electric power and other energies, uh, which account for about 17%, we would have around about 42% of the um, ISDS disputes before exit. Uh, and if we look at the commercial arbitration side, taking, for example, the LCIA and ICC statistics of 2020, uh, we would find that energy accounts for about 26% of the LCIA caseload and uh, the ICC energy accounts are about 15%. And if we look at construction and energy together with the ICC, it will be our close to about 40% mark. So it is really uh, a very important segment of the global economy. Now, how I intend to tackle the future trends, I thought about it and I thought the best way is to consider that from three perspectives. First, industry trends, uh, and I think Mr. Vessel has paved the way to that in relation to certain segments of the industry. So I'll address with you five specific trends of the industry. Then I will move on to cover what I think to be the future trends in relation to um, energy disputes. And of course, oil and gas is a feature for that. But since we're looking into the future, I think it is befitting to tackle and address potentially uh, you know, new disputes that may be on the horizon. And then I will conclude with an observation on the practice and the procedure of energy arbitrations. So starting with the industry trends, um, first, and these are all again based on uh, what you may come across, but partly as well, some predictions from my side. So fossil fuels, as we discussed, obviously oil and gas are fossil fuels in a way. Uh, they're likely to play an important role in at least the short and medium term. There may be a regression in the role on the long term, but today we're talking about more than 80% uh, of the energy mix globally is fossil fuel based, coal, oil and gas. And we know that coal has been in regression, so I think when we look into the past, oil and gas may well become the new past for the renewables, um, as I will be addressing them uh, shortly. So that's my first predictor, is that on the short and medium term, they're likely to continue to play an important role on that global front in the energy sector. Secondly, policies and processes um, are being implemented 
and technology is at the forefront, core and center um, of that uh, uh, type of policies and processes. In fact, we currently see the implementation of um, CCUS, which is the carbon capture use and storage uh, to capture CO2 emissions, which I think is the big elephant in the room when we talk about energy. CO2 emissions from fossil power generation and industrial processes um, is indeed important. And the capturing of that uh, is at the center of attention of states at large. Uh, for example, in the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, so within the UNECE region, countries um, need to deploy zero carbon and negative carbon technologies to capture about 90 gigatons um, of CO2 emissions by 2050. And if people are not familiar with that, 90 gigatons would be around one gigaton is about one billion tons of CO2 emissions. And if people want to put that in context, because the, the number is quite huge, that will be around three years in the past decade of the CO2 emissions. Normally emissions in the past 10 years have been in the range of about 34 to 36 gigatons. So the reduction by 2050 is to capture about 90 gigatons there. Uh, and that is in line with, of course, the Paris Climate Agreement objectives and the Agenda for Sustainable Development uh, of 2030. So that's my second point, which is basically the transition of using uh, uh, carbon capture use and storage. And that will have its effect on the type of disputes as we will address that shortly. And my third uh, uh, trend that I want to discuss with you is basically carbon neutrality uh, will require rapid deployment of carbon capture use and storage, as we mentioned, to bridge the gap until we have uh, innovative new generation of zero or negative carbon technologies that are being commercialized. Um, so that gap filling uh, technology paves the way for the total decarbonization of the industry and the transition and diversification away from fossil fuels towards hydrogen-based clean and green energy, uh, and indeed other types of renewables, including solar, wind, and water. Um, so the fifth aspect, which is then the next wave on the slightly longer term, the proliferation of investments and renewables in a way. We already see investments taking place in the renewable sector, given that it builds on the uh, reduced costs and increased political and global appetite for renewable technologies. Compared to fossil fuels, renewables um, are not that capital intensive compared to fossil fuels. So much of the capital investment that goes into the exploration, exploitation in fossil fuels uh, is reduced when it comes to renewables. But there is definitely a global political appetite for renewable technologies. Now, let's break that down and look at specific aspects of the renewables to discern and ascertain the trends. Uh, solar sector. So the annual solar installations have grown exponentially over the past few years. Um, and in 2020, we've seen a growth in 2021. We've seen a growth of about 30 percent uh, in solar installations with China only accounting for about 35% of that total solar installations annually. Uh, now, of course, there are innovations taking place in PV technologies, which is the photovoltaic technology to capture solar energy. And we see that underway, we have more uh, clear cut reduction in deploying and using more productive and efficient photovoltaic cells. In relation to wind, 2020 was a record year, uh, despite the pandemic, where we have seen a global activity of nearly about 120 gigawatts. Uh, nearly 60% is from China alone. In 2021, the offshore uh, wind industry is expected to deploy about 10 gigawatt of capacity, which is almost as twice as 2020. So we see over a span of a year, 12 months, that is a double in the capacity production from wind energy. 
Now, this is, of course, driven by the boom of installations in China and across the globe. But there are, of course, an appetite for capacity tenders increasing globally with over about 20 gigawatts worth of capacity auctioned in the UK, France, Denmark, Netherlands, Germany, the US, Japan, and Taiwan. Now, oil and gas major players, let me call them the traditionalists, are innovating even themselves, and they are creating new streams of business for renewables. And they are accelerating their investments in that sector, including the offshore wind sector, where they aim to increase their footprint in that space. More generally, with respect to hydrogen-based uh, clean and green energy, which is really the future, and we see many reports predicting and forecasting the use of hydrogen. Uh, 2020, uh, so six major European countries and the European Commission uh, releasing uh, hydrogen-based uh, strategies, even amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. And then Russia, Norway, Chile, Canada also followed suit with their energy frameworks, hydrogen-based energy frameworks in 2020. And that came after already Japan, South Korea, and Australia taking the lead uh, in, on this front. Now, there is sizable funding globally. We see around uh, 44 billion US dollars uh, of funding through various support mechanisms being in, put in place for hydrogen projects uh, in Germany, France, Italy, Spain, and Portugal. And these, uh, this about 44 billion is indeed intended to cover the next 10 years, so up until 2030. So we pretty much see a lot of activity there in relation to industry trends. And one specific, of course, when we come to gas pricing and LNG, we'll see that that continues with us for at least the short and medium term. Now, this takes me to the types of disputes that uh, the future may hold. Uh, to the extent that fossil fuels will continue over the short and medium term to be used and to make up an important segment of the energy field, traditional uh, fossil fuel disputes will continue upstream, midstream, and downstream. And uh, uh, Mr. Vessel has kindly shown us and, and given us a demonstration of these types of disputes. So JOAs, joint operating agreements, uh, farm out agreements, budgeting, exploration and commercialization activities under production sharing agreements uh, will continue. Operational decisions and costs as these players cut on their costs will also continue for the short term and medium term. Taxation and environmental compliance and related disputes are likely to increase pricing supply and, of course, all time favorites, um, be it stabilization or change in law, measure, uh, force majeure, hardship, decommissioning will continue. On gas pricing specifically, since Mr. Vessel has mentioned that, and it really caught my attention, which is uh, an important segment of the oil and gas disputes, in Europe, at the very least, some are even hard arguing now because of the fact that the pricing formulae are linked to uh, a European gas hub, that with the advent of uh, the use of these hubs and the contract price being uh, uh, always tracking, tracking the market, some people think that uh, this may bring a dearth or an end to uh, gas pricing disputes in a way. However, even when there is a hub pricing, there is still a possibility that the risk of the hub price and the price in the end user specific market may diverge, which means that disputes are likely to continue and triggering price review disputes. Now, of course, there are trends as to how to deal with uh, price review disputes and whether tribunals have the discretion to review, come up with formulae and uh, that are different from what the parties are submitting or simply go for a baseball or pendulum type of arbitration when you look at the formulae presented by the parties there. Um, the second aspect of types of disputes would relate to the point I made earlier about uh, the carbon capture use and storage. Uh, this is definitely a potential source for new disputes. And these will be technology related disputes regarding the efficiency and effectiveness of capturing, storing, using, and reusing uh, carbon dioxide as we try to reduce the emissions. So that is a stream of disputes that I predict will find their way into the energy sector even in the near future. 
insolvency, distressed assets, and sale of assets as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the transition from fossil fuels to more uh, green-based uh, assets with zero or negative CO2 emissions are likely to exist. So as people transition from fossil fuels, which are being used by plants and processes across the globe, uh, the technology used could become obsolete, and that may lead to uh, distressed assets or sale of assets aspects that will trigger it and spawn its own disputes. Now, renewables, um, again, renewables related disputes, whether in relation to power generation, uh, operation of facilities, satisfaction of performance tests, price volatility, which I think is an important aspect of renewables, because renewables are by and large dependent uh, on the climate and the weather. And to that extent, you will have most likely price volatility. And with the global warming and aspects of the climate change, this is destined even for more volatility. Uh, and we see, of course, the ECT and ISDS uh, disputes at that front uh, uh, emerging. Uh, climate change requires uh, an episode, to use Alina's words, uh, referring to the current episode, requires an episode of its own. But indeed, uh, we see now a lot of disputes in the pipeline in relation to climate change. And we even see a rise in um, specialized boutique firms dealing exclusively with climate change disputes. So I think that is a new stream of disputes and work for lawyers. And perhaps even uh, 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 not only food for thought, but since we are uh, uh, in an online uh, uh, event uh, uh, by the Lauterbach sort of uh, institute is basically perhaps uh, uh, um, participants may consider research topics on uh, aspects of climate change and new streams of disputes. Uh, I also predict that there will be disputes on the digitalization, the use of big data, smart contracts, which are already finding their way into the energy uh, uh, sector, as well as the internet of things, uh, where we see that you know technology is really underlying most of what we are doing. So to that extent, I think we will uh, see a lot of disputes with a technology focus. And I even predict that we will see technology experts being presented to tribunals to opine and give opinions on the use of certain technologies across all segments of the energy disputes. Now, that has not yet found its way, but I predict that that will be one of the important developments in energy arbitrations. And that brings me to my final part, which is the practice and procedure. I think the practice is also destined for a change. If the trends and the disputes are transitioning and changing, so the practice and the procedure must follow. And that brings me to what I call the triangle of innovation. Uh, much has been said on time and cost in arbitration, but I think more is expected when this is married with technology. Technology will be running the sector and we see a lot of uh, use of artificial intelligence applications um, and uh, uh, technology being deployed and used. So that will ultimately reduce the time and cost of processes and arbitration as an all time favorite uh, for resolution of technology for uh, arbitration for energy disputes will have to follow suit. Um, and with that in mind, I, in response to Mr. Vessel's uh, point about whether ISDS is destined uh, to die, my prediction is that no. Uh, I think that will be an option that will continue along uh, the multi options available uh, in that sense. But I predict that we will see more and more SSDS, so state to state disputes, especially in relation to uh, climate decarbonization because of the sustainable development goals, because of the climate change and the accords and protocols that are in place. So we will see that. And I predict also that we will see a rise in states as claimants vis-a-vis -vis investors, um, and especially on the African continent in that sense where it is still a green field and the resources on the continent uh, are still being deployed and used. So I think Africa will be playing a major role uh, in, uh, on, the, uh, on the roadmap or the landscape of the energy uh, arbitration in that sense. Now, these are few 
predictions, hopefully, that can build on the past and present provided by Mr. Vessel. And I look forward to hopefully a discussion and questions uh, during the Q&A part. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Abdul Wahab. This was also very insightful. And we already have a few questions by, uh, by participants. And of course, each and every one of you that still want to pose questions, uh, please do. And we'll try to address as many of them as possible in the next uh, 15 minutes that we have available for discussion. Uh, so we'll proceed to read one of the questions that we have received. Um, so uh, a question is, which can be addressed to both of you and any of you can, uh, can address it, is do you believe that the emergence of international commercial courts, like the one in Singapore, for example, may have an impact on oil and gas disputes? In other words, do you consider it possible that international commercial courts become a preferable or at least a considerable method to solve oil and gas disputes instead of arbitration in the foreseeable future? Maybe I'll have a first go at that and invite Professor Abdel Wahab to, to comment. Um, I think the short answer is I don't anticipate international commercial courts playing a significant role, in part because most of the disputes in the sector arise under contracts which already provide for international arbitration. So um, I, I haven't seen any disputes going to these commercial courts. The, the one area where I can see an advantage to a court is that there are certain forms of relief that only courts can grant. That may be in, injunctions, uh, freezing orders, um, things like that. So there, there may be an attraction for certain kinds of disputes where those powers are useful to, to bring them to those courts. But otherwise, I, I, I would expect arbitration to remain the, the dominant forum for oil and gas disputes. I, I agree with Mr. Vessel. Let me add one additional thing. The proliferation of international commercial courts and the role when it comes specifically to energy, which involves natural resources in a way and potentially state entities, will be largely dependent on two factors, I think. First, the constitution of these courts and their independence from the state system. Um, if that is not the case, then absolutely arbitration would remain the prominent neutral method to resolve disputes. Um, secondly, uh, the type of disputes that may go before those courts, if it relates to shareholders disputes, so commercial in a sense and not related to directly the resources in a way, or if it relates to supply contracts, then there may be potentially a stream of disputes finding their way to these international commercial courts to the extent that their independence and neutrality from the state court system or traditional litigation proceedings uh, in those states will be maintained. Thank you very much both. Uh, the, the next question goes to Professor Abdel Wahab and it uh, relates to the, to the technology related uh, points in your, uh, in your presentation and it's in what form are smart contracts being currently used in, in, in the energy sectors? Sure, um, I think it is interesting because many people are still now uh, treading carefully along the path of smart contracts. But speaking, uh, or at least knowing, uh, of um, a number of initiatives, especially in relation to construction and energy, I think on the supply front, um, going sort of um, uh, downstream and midstream aspects, transportation, processing, I think this, these are areas where smart contracts can find their way. Uh, let's remember that many of those players in the energy industry, as much as possible, try to avoid disputes because, it's, of course, it's capital intensive and because you're dealing with the state. And if you um, intend, by and large, to take the state to arbitration and its investment arbitration, it may signal in some instances that, of course, that you're exiting the jurisdiction one way or the other. Um, so in a way, smart contracts do offer a possibility that uh, you avoid disputes. So it's an, a dispute avoidance mechanism. Uh, I do not think that smart contracts are yet or in the near future going to be used for capital intensive projects or aspects of the deal, but certainly at the supply, processing, storage, transport, 
these segments of the energy sector, I think smart contracts will play an important role in that sense. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and now a question that either of you can, can address. Uh, it is with, reg uh, with increasing public skepticism, what do you think will become of the Energy Charter Treaty? Do you think contracting states will be successful in adequately reforming the treaty to meet the demands of such skepticism? Uh, and to that, I would like to, to add my own, like I, I was reading recently about the recent uh, Keystone XL pipeline uh, uh, arbitration that's uh, just uh, a notice of intent which just submitted. Uh, and uh, yeah, I was wondering uh, about your thoughts uh, on, the, on, this, uh, on this issue and like whether this, basically the fact that this raises further accusations about the whole ICS system uh, and the fact that uh, this might hamper uh, the energy transition of several states when they are being accused basically for, be, for adopting climate-friendly climate, climate friendly measures. Maybe I'll um, have a first cut at this and invite Professor Abdul Wahab to comment. So um, you know, personally, my, my prognostics for investment treaty arbitration is, is quite um, pessimistic pessimistic in the sense of it continuing to be an area where arbitration professionals can work as counsel and arbitrators. The backlash is very profound. It is also very ill-informed. And so it's, we're not having actually a sort of reasoned debate. We're having this sort of backlash that is largely disconnected from what's actually happening. But it makes it very difficult for any kind of sensible response. You know, you, you can't reform something when what people think is the problem is not the real problem. And um, I, I, don't, I don't see much prospect for reforming things like the Energy Charter Treaty or the other treaties. People, I think a lot of increasingly uh, countries will withdraw or denounce these treaties. You know, in, in, and there's a, so much misunderstanding about what's happening. You know, the famous case is the Vattenfall case in Germany, where the, the big issue, the, the reason that the German state had to pay compensation was not because of international arbitration under the Energy Tr Charter Treaty. It was a decision of the, the German court. And, you know, the, the people, of, the, what's often lost sight of is before, what typically arises in these cases is it's you have um, it, it essentially a, it's a property expropriation context. You know, governments are free to implement whatever policies they want, but sometimes those policies have costs. You know, if, if the government decides to build a road through Alina's house, they have to compensate Alina for her land, for her house. And, you know, to, to me, this is, it's not different here. If, if, the government uh, has decided, okay, you know, this we're, we're leaving nuclear power. So all the people who are operating nuclear power plants have lost their investments. They may be entitled to compensation. That may be part of the cost of these policies. That doesn't mean states can't and shouldn't do them. But it's that you know, I, I think we're having a debate that's losing sight of the fact that policies have costs that have to be factored in and we can quibble about how much the cost should be, how much compensation, somebody who's invested perhaps billions in a nuclear power plant and then they're, they're forbidden from using it, you know, what, what compensation should they be entitled to? But the, to me, the principle um, is something that has off, is often lost sight of in the criticism of the system. Sorry for that rambling answer, but not at all. It makes my life easier because uh, I agree with Mr. Vessel. And let me add one thing. I mean, with the ECT specifically, which has more than about 50 uh, member states from Europe, Central Asia and other regions, it is difficult um, to amend or reconsider. And we see a spike in a number of cases. So I think uh, it is not destined to end in a way. And I think the question is a legitimate one, but I think the skepticism uh, is more broadly uh, to the field uh, at large rather than the ECT specifically. 
So I fully agree with what Mr. Vesta has mentioned, and I think uh, it is unlikely that the ECT will come to an end, at least soon. Thank you very much both. Uh, and uh, one of our participants, on, an, on, a different, on a separate note, one of our participants is wondering uh, if there were any expectations or predictions regarding the type of oil uh, and gas disputes in the North African region specifically, given the political situation there and whether this is expected to affect uh, new disputes arising, that's one. Well, that, that's interesting. I, I mean, I'm happy to take that and, and Mr. Bessel can add his thoughts there. Um, let me say the following. I mean, when you're in the Middle East, in the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, um, it is very interesting because the exposure that you have to the different types of disputes practices is very enriching and makes, uh, makes it all the more interesting when you're practicing arbitration there, because there's always something new happening. So yes, the answer is, as I mentioned earlier in my opening, uh, energy disputes are of course sensitive to the political environment and contracts. So the North African region is always destined for something new, let's put it this way. And I think the interesting thing is that we see a number of cases increasing across the energy, um, different fields, construction or otherwise. So yes, what, what we will probably, and what we've seen talking about the past and present is that with a change in government, one way or the other, there is always disputes that follow suit, which is projects become disowned children by the new government. And that leads to a wave of disputes uh, on the business, commercial and investment uh, spectra and then it brings questions about whether there is expropriation, uh, discrimination, uh, lack of fair and equitable treatment on the investment front or non-payment, non-delivery, lack of supply issues and even uh, termination of uh, concession agreements. So I think the answer is yes, uh, there is always this expectation. The thing about uh, the Middle East and North Africa, is that none of this can anymore be characterized as unforeseeable. Because even though we cannot foresee change, we have seen what a change brings about, be it a spring, uh, be it a summer or a winter, whatever you wish to call it, they always spawn their own wave of disputes with a change on the political landscape. There is also, I think, one additional question uh, regarding predictions about legal tech. Yes, exactly. So this could be our last question for, for today. Uh, so uh, unless uh, Mr. Vassal wants to add anything about the previous question, I'll leave it to Professor Abdul Wahab to, uh, to elaborate on, on the question, which is, I'll read it for the benefit of, uh, of everyone, uh, is a follow-up basically to the smart contract discussion we started before. Uh, that with regards to your prediction about legal tech specialists working with those in the energy and gas sector, how do you predict the collaboration will carry out? And without sufficient IT no, uh, knowledge or knowledge of blockchain networks, is it hard to understand how smart contracts work? Thus, I, thus the participant is curious how the gap would be filled. And they further ask, which blockchain network do you think is the best option currently for the energy and gas sector? It's a lot of specific sub question there and it is it's a it's a composite question now let's say it's probably looks like a compounded request in a red fern schedule what do you request? <laughs> anyway let me say it, it again it raises excellent points but i will be very short brief and candid so that mr best can add his thoughts i think well smart contracts is the next big thing but blockchain specifically which is a type of technology using a distributive ledger and stuff i think at present it is overrated regarding its role we tend to think that blockchain is going to impact significantly each and everything. I think technology will, but blockchain itself remains to be tested. So far, it has been used in certain aspects. I doubt that the energy, including the oil and gas sector, will immediately be impacted by blockchain, though smart contracts will play a role. I think there is a lot that remains to be ascertained regarding blockchain. I even predict that there will be a degree of regulation uh, regarding uh, blockchain technology across the globe. Uh, states 
I mean, building at least uh, building on the past and the present that we've seen. Uh, once a new, let me call it product or a new application or a new technology is out there, that's fine. But when it becomes increasingly used and proliferated to an extent that it creates issues for states, regulation kicks in. And because of the energy sector, the involvement of state and state-owned entities, one can only expect that there could be a degree of regulation in that sense. Uh, now, the gap cannot be immediately filled in a way, but I think we um, are yet to see the impact of smart contracts on the energy sector. I did give a prediction about where they could be used, but I think blockchain remains to be tested in that sense. Perhaps it could be used for payments, uh, and that is indeed an area where blockchain has been comfortably used when making payments. But I think for contracts specifically, we're yet to see its impact. Thank you very much. M uh, Mr. Vassal, any additional comments? Well, I'm not on the blockchain question, I was just thinking about the previous question about yeah. disputes in the MENA region. And uh, you know, I, guess I, I tend to look at things through the lens of the past um, and the recent past in particular in Egypt was very um, revelatory about how a political disruption can create a sort of cascade of effects that generate oil and gas disputes. So you will recall during the Arab Spring, there was, there was significant disruptions to the production and distribution of natural gas. And the, you have some big LNG products projects in Egypt that were dependent on supply of natural gas to feed these LNG chains. And suddenly the supply was interrupted. The government was saying, we need the supply domestically. It's, you know, it's getting into the hot period of the year. We need to supply the air conditioners. And um, meanwhile, this, the situation was uncertain. So there was less investment in drilling for more gas. And you had this kind of cascading effect of um, disputes being generated all along the, the sort of production chain, feeding and supplying these LNG plants and downstream to the people they were supposed to sell the LNG to. And I, I think that example sort of illustrates how, where you have volatility, political volatility, anywhere you have to be in, 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 it can very quickly generate this kind of cascade of disputes where in, in this industry where you have long-term contracts, long-term projects that are very capital intensive and that you know depend upon a certain degree of stability to fruition. So you know to the extent we're in a world of perhaps increasing instability politically um, uh, and otherwise, we can expect to see more of that kind of uh, ripple effect and and the next waves may be due to climate change you know we may have um, crises provoked by rising water levels unlivable temperatures with power systems for air conditioning going down you know you, you can you can imagine the scenarios that might provoke a similar kind of scenario thank you very much both uh, and our participants for posing the questions. And we'll, uh, with this, we'll have to wrap up and apologies for, and I'm sorry that we don't get to continue this discussion. It's a very interesting discussion further. Uh, I will uh, give the floor to, your, uh, to, to our speakers in case they want to make any final comments before closing this meeting. From my side, nothing other than to thank you, our participants and Mr. Vessel. Uh, it has been a great, at least part of the evening for me. And um, thank you very much for the kind invitation. And I wish you all the best of success for all the future episodes that you intend to uh, put forward. I'd just like to echo those thanks. It's uh, you know, an honor and, and always an interesting moment to um, listen to Professor Abdul Wahab. And, and that, only, my only regret is that we're not all sitting together in, in Cambridge and can carry on the conversation uh, over a drink, but uh, hopefully next time. Th thank you all very much. Thank you both very much. And uh, on behalf of both the Cambridge Arbitration Society and the Law Department Center of International Law, 
Uh, it's been a great honor and pleasure of having you both. And I believe the participants from the comments that I see echo this, uh, this sentiment. Uh, thank you very much and have a good afternoon, evening uh, to everyone, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you very much.